Well, the House Energy and Commerce Committee says that the first hearing under its new Democratic leadership will be about climate change. Some of the newest members of Congress emphasize the issue in their campaigns and has also become a hot button topic with prospective 2020 presidential candidates. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg recently released a book on potential solutions to solve the growing climate crisis. And Washington Governor Jay Inslee has toyed with the idea of running in 2020 on the climate change platform. All this comes as scientists are warning that 2019 could be the hottest year on record and as a likely El Nino event approaches the country. Samantha Stevenson is an assistant professor and climate scientist at the University of California, Santa Barbara's Bren School of Environmental Science and Management. She's also a co-author of the study of the impact of El Nino. Samantha, thank you very much for joining us. Can you explain for us why 2019 could really be a record-breaking year for temperatures? Oh, sure, of course. So, I mean, it's still a little bit early to say whether 2019 will, in fact, be the hottest year ever. But generally speaking, when you have an El Nino event, what, um, the ocean is releasing a lot of heat into the atmosphere. And so that's it, it tends to lead to a hotter than average global temperature. And so when that's layered on top of the warming trends that we're already seeing, where in fact already some like nine out of the 10 hottest years on record have occurred since 2005, and you're adding another El Nino-induced uh, warming on top of that, then that's why we expect that you, there could be another temperature record set. But again, it's we have to wait and see a few months before we, uh, we know exactly how much warming we're going to see. You know, the most recent El Nino event ended in 2016. What are the consequences of that? So an El Nino is associated with warming in the Pacific Ocean in the eastern equatorial Pacific. And that has effects both on the ocean itself and it affects weather patterns throughout the world. So it tends to, uh, for example, shift the, the, the jet stream, the, that band of winds that come from the west towards the east over the, the western part of the U.S. to the south. And so in, in Southern California, like where I am in Santa Barbara, we tend to see higher than average rainfall during an El Nino event. But you see changes in the weather, again, like I said, throughout the world. So generally speaking, it gets warmer than average in the eastern part of the U.S. You tend to see droughts in places like Australia and in Southern Africa. So it really affects weather um, around the world. So if 2019 is an El Nino year, what do you think it would mean for places like California, where more than a million acres were scored? So, yeah, the impacts on California weather could be significant. Uh, the what I should say here is that every El Nino is a little bit different. They're each like their own little special snowflakes in a way, right? So, the 2016 El Nino didn't have the uh, this uh, impacts on rainfall that we expected that it might because there were other things that were happening uh, to the weather that prevented that increased rainfall from getting into Southern California. So, we could expect to see more severe rainstorms in Southern California. We could expect to see warmer than average temperatures, but we're really gonna have to wait and see how things, for example, in the North Pacific play out and how that interacts with what the El Nino is doing itself. I wanna play for you what Speaker Nancy Pelosi said on the House floor yesterday about climate change. We must also face the existential threat of our time, the climate crisis, a crisis manifested in natural disasters of epic proportions. The American people understand the urgency. The people are ahead of the Congress. The Congress must join them. And that is why we have created a select committee on climate crisis. The entire Congress must work to put an end to the inaction and denial of science that threaten the planet and the future. Do you think politicians have done enough on the issue of climate change? I think there's still a lot of work to be done on addressing climate change, and I'm heartened to see people like Speaker Pelosi start to really address the urgency of this issue. And I think that really it's it's not about partisan politics. It's really about trying to use the best science that we can to come up with the best solutions that we can for both the U.S. and the world. So I'm, I'm glad to see that this is happening, but I think that there's a lot that we can do as individuals to try to communicate with our elected representatives and really hammer home the urgency of the climate change problem. What more would you like to see them do? What else could be done that could make a significant difference? Well, I, as a scientist, I hesitate to make specific policy recommendations, but I would like to see uh, maybe more science brought into decisions that are being made about things like natural resource management, about 
uh, things like the uh, carbon emissions reductions that are being discussed on kind of a nationwide and uh, international level. So the, really, the more we can have informed debates that really include science as the basis for those decisions, the better off that we'll be. Samantha Stevenson, so grateful you could join us. Samantha, thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much for having me.